Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Honigberg. I'm a cardiologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Today, we'll be talking about the evaluation of secondary hypertension. Key takeaways from today's video are to review key secondary causes of and contributors to hypertension, to be able to recognize medication classes that can raise blood pressure, and to perform appropriate evaluation for causes of secondary hypertension. The term primary hypertension typically refers to hypertension not caused by an underlying medical condition. This may be driven by age, other cardiometabolic traits such as elevated body weight, and lifestyle factors such as a high salt diet, high sedentary time, lack of physical activity. Secondary hypertension, by contrast, has some distinguishing features. It is classically abrupt in onset and or unusually severe. Typically, it is driven by an underlying medical condition or by medications or substance use. A specific remediable secondary cause of hypertension may be identified in up to 10% of individuals with a diagnosis of hypertension. It bears emphasizing that this primary versus secondary distinction is not perfect. Not all cases of secondary hypertension are dramatic in their presentation, and some secondary causes may contribute to or worsen pre-existing primary hypertension. However, remembering secondary causes is helpful for comprehensively evaluating and managing patients and to guide additional evaluation when appropriate. A recent study found that 18.5% of U.S. adults with a diagnosis of hypertension were using medications that raise blood pressure. Some commonly used medications with blood pressure raising effects include oral contraceptives, particularly those with high estrogen content, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, amphetamines, certain antidepressant classes, decongestants, and corticosteroids. Also, certain weight loss medications and some cancer therapies such as bevacizumab may also raise blood pressure. There is a relatively long list of other secondary causes of hypertension. These are some of the more common ones, and I will review them in order of generally more common to generally less common. Obstructive sleep apnea is a relatively common cause or contributor to elevated blood pressure. This would be suggested clinically by a history of snoring, daytime hypersomnolence, or morning headaches. Primary hyperaldosteronism refers to excess production of the hormone aldosterone by the adrenal glands. This would be suggested by elevated serum sodium levels, decreased potassium levels, and metabolic alkalosis. Recent data suggests that primary hyperaldosteronism is substantially more prevalent than we previously appreciated, with reasonable prevalence even among individuals with only mildly elevated blood pressures or even seemingly normal blood pressures. Renovascular hypertension refers to abnormalities of the renal arteries that lead to elevated blood pressure. This can take the form of atherosclerotic disease causing renal artery stenosis or a condition called fibromuscular dysplasia a vascular abnormality more typically seen in young individuals. Historical clues to these conditions might include abrupt onset and or labile hypertension after age 55, which would specifically raise suspicion for an atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis process, pulmonary edema complicating hypertension, and a decrease in kidney function. Primary kidney disease, including nephrotic syndrome, may also lead to hypertension. And in the case of nephrotic syndrome, this may be accompanied with new onset edema. Hyperthyroidism may manifest clinically with weight loss that's unintended, palpitations, hypertension, and elevated heart rate. Cushing syndrome is an endocrine disorder characterized by excess production of the hormone cortisol. This causes excess weight gain, increased central adiposity, and stray of the skin. Pheochromocytoma is a rare neuroendocrine tumor secreting catecholamines. This manifests clinically with labile blood pressures, palpitations, headache, and classically orthostasis, or positional blood pressure changes. Coarcation of the aorta is a congenital aortic abnormality, which may recur later in life. So knowing history of coarcation repair is important. Evaluation of the patient with newly diagnosed hypertension includes a careful history, along with medication review, and a thorough physical examination. A complete physical exam should include assessment of postural vital signs, evidence of tremor, evaluation of the pulses, and auscultation for a renal artery brewery. Standard initial laboratory testing 
includes serum electrolytes and creatinine for estimation of kidney function, assessment of glycemia, either with fasting glucose or a hemoglobin A1C level, a lipid panel, thyroid stimulating hormone, and a urinalysis with or without a urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. Secondary hypertension should be considered whenever there is suggestive history, and particularly in certain conditions or situations. One of those is resistant hypertension, which is defined as persistent or refractory hypertension despite the use of three distinct antihypertensive medication classes, including a diuretic. Other situations include onset before age 30 years, abrupt onset in a patient with previously normal or well-controlled blood pressure, deterioration of kidney function with introduction of an ACE inhibitor or ARB would specifically suggest the possibility of renovascular hypertension, and excessive hypokalemia would suggest the possibility of hyperaldosteronism. How do we evaluate these different possibilities? The evaluation, the diagnostic workup, should be guided by clinical history and clinician judgment. Obstructive sleep apnea would be diagnosed with a sleep study and treated with continuous positive airway pressure at nighttime. Hyperaldosteronism would be diagnosed with plasma aldosterone and renin levels. Renovascular hypertension would be diagnosed with renal artery duplex Doppler ultrasonography, and possibly with cross-sectional abdominal imaging. Primary kidney disease would be diagnosed with a renal ultrasound to rule out an obstructive process and laboratory tests to discern an underlying cause. Hyperthyroidism would be diagnosed with thyroid function tests, Cushing syndrome with a dexamethasone suppression test, theochromocytoma typically with 24-hour urine metanephrines and abdominal cross-sectional imaging, and coarctation of the aorta with echocardiography with or without cross-sectional aortic imaging. The management of secondary hypertension depends very much on any identifiable underlying causes. For patients using blood pressure raising medications, ideally these medications should be withdrawn and replaced with alternatives that do not raise blood pressure. Management of endocrine causes typically requires specialist involvement to properly diagnose and treat the underlying condition. In cases of renal artery stenosis, evaluation for revascularization of the renal artery should be considered if medical management is unsuccessful or there is underlying fibromuscular dysplasia. It is worth emphasizing, and the guidelines note this as well, antihypertensive therapy will frequently be required even if a remediable cause is identified and addressed, such as in the cases of renal artery stenosis or obstructive sleep apnea. So to summarize this video, we reviewed key secondary causes of and contributors to hypertension. You've learned to recognize medication classes that can raise blood pressure, and you've learned to perform appropriate targeted evaluation for causes of secondary hypertension. Thank you for watching today. I hope you found this video educational.